Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello everyone and welcome to Louisiana Spotlight. I'm Andre Morrow, Managing Editor and Anchor here at LPB. Tonight's topic, redistricting, has been hotly debated over the past few months and it affects every single person in our state. Redistricting happens every 10 years once the U.S. Census is completed. The data collected is used to draw maps for U.S. conditional districts, state house and senate districts, as well as the districts for the Public Service Commission, courts, and the Board of Education. The 2020 census revealed that while Louisiana's black population increased by more than 3%, Louisiana's white population declined by 6%. These changes have created one of the most contentious issues in how the new maps should be drawn and about minority representation. Currently, there is only one minority majority district out of six in the state, seemingly giving black Louisianans only one sixth of the state's representation, even though simple mathematics shows that they make up one third of the population. But redistricting is not as simple as it might seem. Tonight, we'll take a deep look into redistricting, what it is, why it's important, and what it means for you. We're going to hear from legislators, citizens, and legal professionals who've been battling over these bills. And we'll also hear from stakeholders who bring up issues in redistricting that very few think about. But first, let's take a look at the history of redistricting in Louisiana and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. My name is Greg Rigamer, and I am a political consultant and pollster. The history of redistricting in Louisiana repeats itself every 10 years. The philosophy of redistricting is one man, one vote. So redistricting is initiated to ensure equal representation by our elected officials. Every 10 years with the decennial census, we look at what are the districts and how does the current population compare to the population 10 years ago when the districts were drawn. And if we see changes, you typically redistrict. We redistrict congressional districts, house districts, senate districts, public service commission districts, BESI districts. The majority of elected officials come from a district that must be configured to provide equal representation to the citizens of that district. Theoretically, all districts should be of equal size or within a very small fraction of difference. Uh, communities of interest should be kept together to the extent possible, and districts should be compact as possible in terms of go out of a given area to incorporate particular interests. Now, as a practical matter, because of the Voting Rights Act, minority communities are protected. And so while we say districts should be compact, you can clearly and are required to protect minority voting rights, even to the extent of making a district that is not, quote, compact to represent the desired population. And we see that with Congressional District 2 in Louisiana. We stretch from New Orleans East all the way up to East Baton Rouge Parish. This is Eugene Collins uh, from the NAACP Presidents. This is uh, this Sunday. We're going to be probably talking about voting and redistricting. So tune in and check it out and get educated. Talk to y'all soon. My name is Eugene Collins. I'm the president of the Baton Rouge branch of the NAACP. Our goal is to fight race-based discrimination, and we were founded by a multicultural group of folks that knew we would need an organization like this to continuously provide checks and balances as minorities started to gain more rights. The issues are almost identical, right? We've just found a new vacuum to put them in. 
John Lewis was, was marching for voting rights in Selma, you know, and, and we know around that time in the Voting Rights Act of, Act of 1965 in Congress, they were turning advocacy into actual policy at that point, right? It wasn't just a march. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. But when you saw John Lewis and Dr. King and they were, they were advocating for these things and they were turning these things into policy, at that point, it was all about making sure that black folk had an equitable opportunity to cast their ballot, right? But what we leave out in that law sometimes is that it was also to make sure that there was no vote dilution. And vote dilution typically will come through redistricting, right? Making sure that those maps aren't equitable so that the minority vote doesn't count for the same thing as the white folk, right? And that's, that, that's what it is in its core essence. Because this has always been about race when it comes down to vote dilution. And redistricting has always been a key to that. This country has always tried to make sure that the black vote didn't mean the same thing as everybody else. Um, whether it was actually physically stopping people from going to the polls, uh, or what we see today in 2022 of, hey, we're going to move this line on this map a little bit so that these folks can vote in this district that's 90% white, and their vote means nothing. We know the African-American population in this state increased. That means that there needs to be an additional minority congressional seat. That, that's just a fact. There are two issues in redistricting. I mean, you have size and you have concentration. And so as a practical matter, one third of the state is African-American, but you have clusters of African-Americans in the major urban areas, but distributed elsewhere. As a result, to get two African-American majority congressional districts, you drop from 60 plus percent representation of African-American in like Congressional District 2 to something that goes into the low to mid 50%. You certainly improve the opportunity to have more minority representation. Unequivocally, that's a fact. The converse of that is in most large elections in the state, voter turnout among white voters is greater than African-American voters. When you have a district that's 60% African-American, that turnout differential isn't that great of a concern. When you have a district that's 52% African-American, that comes into play. We have to mobilize black voters, you know, and, and but that is not a reason to not create something that's equitable, right? You can't say, well, let's not do this because they ain't gonna take advantage of it. Like, you create a process and then you leave it up to the people to do the right things with it. But we shouldn't let what a population does dictate what we know is right to do. Maybe we don't turn out in the first few elections. Maybe it's 10 or 15 or 10 or 20 years from now when we actually get people uh, to move and see the importance of it. But if it's not in place, my son, our daughters, are going to be stuck fighting the same issues that we're fighting right now and not progressing forward. Put it in place now. Let's work on driving folks to the polls. Let's make their vote mean something. If, if that happens, we could change the scope, the landscape, what leadership looks like. And that's fear for people that enjoy the status quo. And that ain't always white or black. Well, so there's a lot to unpack there. Clearly, the redistricting process is complex and it's nuanced. And joining me now to help us get a better understanding of the issues, and there are many, is Dr. Stephen Procopio. He's president of Public Affairs Research Council of Louisiana. And Dr. Procopio, thanks so much for being here uh, to talk about this. We just heard some of the history behind redistricting to bring us up to date. But where do the maps and House Bill 1, where do they stand right now? Oh, first of all, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, the maps stand where I think everyone, including myself, thought they would be in the courts. 
Uh, if you go and actually watch it with, uh, go and see what happened in session, it was less about the political angles and what was going to happen with the bill as it was what's going to happen when this eventually gets to court. And if you go, you can see the, uh, the Democrats and the civil rights groups were clearly setting out a trail of evidence to justify their case. And you see the Republicans on the other side were setting out their defense. And the arguments were less about, well, what bill is going to pass and what's the shape of it, as opposed to, well, what are we going to say in court? And will the court process be something that drags on, or will it be a, a short process? I would be shocked if it was short. Uh, there will probably be uh, some hearings to deal with the map immediately, like what's going to happen in the next election, because we have an election coming up soon, and so there'll be a series of motions and hearings over that, and what map do we use for that? And then probably a longer process to see, okay, what are we eventually going to use? And I suspect uh, you know, that will probably lean toward the, either the current map or, you know, the existing map for the most recent or the election coming up. But longer term, it's a different game. Yeah, on one hand, redistricting seems like it's about math, uh, but there are real human lives at stake here and the values that come into play. How should we approach redistricting? Well, it, it really is a math problem, but it's not a simple math problem. There's lots going on. Uh, even if you just put aside everything else like representation and compactness, there are you know, billions of different ways to draw equal size districts in terms of population. So there's lots of ways to do it. But then you have to look at sort of things like, well, what kind of districts do we want? And normally you want compact districts that fit around communities or towns or parishes. Uh, that's what you're sort of aiming for. But you also want equal representation. So you want to make sure there's no minority groups that are disenfranchised. You want to make sure they have a stake in the game. So it seems very hard and those things uh, fight with each other and there's never going to be a perfect redistricting. We're going to show you now a Congressional District 2, which has come under fire for being gerrymandered, stretching all the way from New Orleans to Baton Rouge. So what exactly is gerrymandering and is District 2 an example of that? Gerrymandering is very hard to define and sort of common discussion, it's sort of a weird or funny looking district. Uh, legally, it, it can be very different. And you can have gerrymandering for partisan reasons, which isn't illegal. You can uh, you know, use the map to your partisan advantage and the Supreme Court hasn't um, said that's a problem, or at least not yet. But racial gerrymandering is a problem. Uh, and so there's different ways that you can do that. You can push a lot of uh, the same group in one district to make sure uh, you minimize their impact or you can spread it out. So one is called packing and the other one's called cracking. And these are the different tools of gerrymandering. At the end of the day though, there's not one clear bright line that says uh, this is gerrymandering and this isn't. There isn't racial gerrymandering, the one that is referred to the most? Well, racial gerrymandering is the one that will get you in trouble legally. Yes, sir. Right. right. So you, but you, you can certainly make the argument that there is partisan gerrymandering everywhere, but that's not going to get your maps thrown out of court. Well, so let me ask you about this. The maps are headed to the courts. Do you think they would hold up in court? And would lawmakers be forced to go back to the drawing board? So the second question is easier. If they don't hold up, then they will have to go back to the drawing board with instructions uh, from the court that say you need to try harder to add another minority district. Um, so that's, that's the easy question. Will they hold up or not? That's very difficult. Even for legal scholars, that's going to be a difficult question. Well, we've got the 2024 elections coming up, and so uh, it seems that this needs to be settled sooner than later, um, and the maps would need to be finalized. And so I suspect that the court will probably be um, you know, conservative, and it was small c conservative in, in the sense of they probably are not going to make us go back and redraw maps for the immediate elections. But for the uh, 2024, uh, the, probably you know, there will either be a new map ready to go uh, or this will be settled one way or another. It's possible it could drag on for many years. And if it drags on for many years, the maps as we have known them, they remain, correct? That's correct. Or, it, or it's also another possibility. It could be, well, the map that passed, that's what we're going to use until we come with something else. That's still yet to be determined. Well, if the maps make it out of the courts, are we kicking the can down the road uh, for another generation to fight the next 10 years? Well, we're going to have to fight it every 10 years anyway. Uh, so I don't know if it's kicking a can down the road. You're going to have a big fight. There's going to be a result. And in 10 years, there'll be another big fight and there'll be a result. That's just how the Constitution is set up. So this is something we will have to come back every decade and deal with. It's always going to be a big fight. Um, there are always going to be issues. How this one settles out, I mean, it will have an impact on the elections for the next 10 years. 
There's certainly a lot to talk about with it, isn't there? Oh, there's so much <laughs> from the political realm to the yeah. legal realm to actually what the district should look like. In so many levels. Dr. Procopio, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate you helping us understand this a little bit better, understanding redistricting in our state. And still coming up, I'm going to sit down with the legislators who manage the redistricting process to better understand these issues. But first, we're going to take a look at what the governor said, what he has said throughout this process. I do remain very concerned about making sure the maps are fair. There you have six districts. That's what we're entitled to, according to the latest census. A third of our population is African-American. We can all do math. One third of six is two. Can two be drawn? The answer is yes, in any number of ways. I will start by saying that, that I'm obviously disappointed. Um, I am certainly not surprised. I knew when I vetoed the bill that that was uh, a possible, if not likely, outcome. It's not easy to understand why uh, the majority of the House and the Senate refused multiple times to do what is right and what is fair. And nobody should have to have a Voting Rights Act to tell them what is right and fair. Nobody should have to have a court interpret and apply the Voting Rights Act to tell us that what we did was unfair. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, this demonstrates that the state of Louisiana, even in 2022, is not ready to come out of some form of supervision. I cannot imagine there is a more compelling case uh, for the courts to take a look at and to overturn than the congressional map here in Louisiana. I happen to believe that, that it's a very clear case that it violates the, the Voting Rights Act. We're fortunate to have the representatives and policy advisors who work closest on redistricting Louisiana with us today here in our LPB studios. Senator Sharon Hewitt represents District 1 in Slidell and is the chairwoman and Senate and Governmental Affairs Committee, which oversees redistricting. Senator Cleo Field represents District 14 in Baton Rouge and submitted multiple maps of his own to the Governmental Affairs Committee. And Jarrett Evans is the voting rights attorney for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which also proposed maps of their own and recently filed federal lawsuits against the congressional map as well as the state Senate and House map. So let's begin, uh, Senator Hewitt. And I want to start with a look at the congressional map that was passed by the legislature. Senator Hewitt, you were the chairwoman of the Senate and Governmental Affairs Committee. What was the process of coming up with this map that we see? Well, of course, we did a number of things to come up with this map. We held a number of, of public hearings around the state as well as at the state capitol. And, you know, we're very confident that this map does satisfy the Voting Rights Act. This is a very legal process. We're bound by the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which on the one hand says, you know, if there is a minority population of sufficient size that's geographically compact, that you need to be able to draw a district that would include them as a minority district. We're also bound by the 14th Amendment, which says you cannot use race as the predominant reason for drawing a district. And then we had our redistricting principles that we passed in the legislature. And so we used all of that to, to basically draw the congressional map that we ultimately passed, the governor vetoed, and the legislature overrode. Yeah, so a number of factors involved in this. Senator, was the process and its outcome, this map, equitable? Well, I believe so. You know, the legislature is bound by federal law and state law, as well as the redistricting principles that we as a legislature passed, which considered communities of interest and other things. Equal population, of course, is one of the redistricting principles. And so we're very confident that the work that we did meets all of that criteria. And, you know, as you said in the beginning, the the legislature passed the map, the governor vetoed it, we did override it as a legislature, and and uh, we'll continue to take the case forward to court. Thank you, Senator Hewitt. Uh, Senator Fields, I'll ask the same question to you. Is the map equitable? No, absolutely not. Look, when you look at the fact that there are 1.5 million people in this state that are African Americans, it makes no sense whatsoever to not have a second majority minority district. When, when, when the chairwoman of the committee took testimony across the state of Louisiana, 
there were people all over the state that testified. They said they wanted a second majority minority district in the state. I mean, they made the record clear. And, and the committee took the testimony. Now, the plan that we passed, I think it was Senate Bill 5, Senate Bill 5, that was vetoed by the governor, and they overwrote the governor's veto. Well, let me just tell you, the plan that I submitted to the Senate, it had a better deviation than Senate Bill 5. It was more compact, split less parishes. It was absolutely a better plan. It makes no sense whatsoever to plan to pass a plan that's that's less compact, that flies in the face of all of the uh, subsection two of the Voting Rights Act, uh, and and then pass a plan that's just less contiguous. I, I just don't understand it, you know. But at the end of the day, the courts will decide. And I know that you know the, the chairwoman, uh, you know, say, well, you, we could do it. And, 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 and I respect her position, but she takes the position that, listen, if we create the second minority district, it really wouldn't give minorities an opportunity to elect a candidate of their choice. Well, that's just not true. It's just not true, you know? It, it wouldn't perform. You know, the Voting Rights Act does not guarantee outcome. It just says give, the, give minorities an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And we presented the plans, and, and both of them, all of them failed, and now it's time for the courts to act. So, Mr. Evans, is it possible to have an equitable congressional map that is only one minority majority district? It is possible. Um, you would have to look at, you know, if there was a, a map that had one minority district and there was a, uh, a second district that was presented an opportunity uh, for the minorities in that district to elect a candidate of their choice, I'm assuming it would be something in the high 40s, um, then yes, it's possible, but that's not what the plan uh, SB5 that the governor vetoed did. It uh, ensured that the minority choice candidate would be defeated in five out of six of the congressional districts. And I'm so glad that both Senator Hewitt and Senator Fields brought up the roadshow hearing, uh, hearings across the state. I don't know if you remember, Senator, but I was the first witness that you called on in Monroe way back in October. Um, and the overwhelming sentiment from the roadshow was that voters came to the microphone one after the other and begged and pleaded the with the legislature to place them in a district where they had an opportunity to elect a candidate of their choice. Um, in Monroe, voters came to the microphone and talked about our crumbling uh, infrastructure, how our roads and bridges were falling apart and that only one member of our congressional delegation voted for President Biden's infrastructure package. Uh, in Alexandria, uh, I was where I testified as well, Senator, um, a lot of voters came to the microphone and talked about, you know, even after the horrific video of Ronald Green's death was made public, only one member of our congressional delegation uh, voted for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And when it came to Baton Rouge, where I was there as well, um, dozens of voters of color came to the microphone and talked about how our voting rights are under attack, how we're suffering, uh, how black and brown people are in this state are suffering under those maps, and only one member of our congressional delegation supported the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. So that is why we feel that the maps that we proposed and that Senator Fields proposed were a lot more responsive uh, to uh, the sentiments of, of voters from the roadshow. Okay, thank you very much. What well, Senator Hewitt, Numerous maps proposed by Senator Fields, as he mentioned, the NAACP, the ACLU, that did include two minority-majority districts. So why not adopt it? Well, you know, it's, it's an easy talking point to say that, you know, one-third of our population is minority and therefore we should have two out of six congressional districts. But it matters where people live. So I'll give you an, an kind of a, a crazy example. Suppose you took the one-third of the, of the black citizens in our state and perfectly homogeneously distributed them throughout the state of Louisiana. You would have no minority districts because you would not be able to draw them where it's sufficiently compact. So likewise, I appreciate the emotion around the Voting Rights Act and, and the, the right to vote and wanting to have a second congressional district, but it does matter where people live. 
And so in, in my judgment, and I think the majority of the legislature, as evidenced by their voting on this bill, we could not draw two minority districts that we believed would perform as minority districts. Uh, the, the one district that we have, Congressional District 2, uh, performs, and we have evidence of that. It performs as a minority district. A second minority district would basically take minority voters from that district to be the base of creating an, another minority district. And you would end up with two minority districts that would really not perform in a way where they would be able to elect a candidate of, of their choice. All right, so Senator Fields, you hear that. I, I heard Your response. It. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that just, it's just not right. It's just not, it's not true. I mean, uh, the, the second district in New Orleans, as long as it's, it's been a majority minority district, it has performed. Uh, the numbers has been, you know, we've run the numbers. It will perform under the plan that we presented to the legislature. That, with all due respect to the chair, chairwoman, she has no evidence to suggest that neither of these districts would perform. I mean, these district, districts would perform. You know, and, it, and, and listen, when you give people an opportunity to, to elect a, ch a candidate of their choice, they do. And, 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 and that's all the Voting Rights Act provides. It does not guarantee outcome. And the chair, uh, chairwoman understands that and she knows that. We were not in the legislature this session saying, give us a district that will guarantee an African American an election to Congress. No, we were saying give us a district that guarantees African American an opportunity to elect a candidate, a candidate of their choice. Okay. Because that's all the Voting Rights Act provides. But instead of doing that, you know, it we, we have now five districts that will guarantee that 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 blacks will not get elected instead of having two districts that blacks will have an opportunity to elect the candidate of their choice. All right, so Mr. Evans, let me go back to you now. Was the legal defense fund's role uh, in drawing these maps, but was it exactly? Well, from the very beginning, we uh, work to ensure that there was a robust count for the census, as I'm sure that uh, that you are, are well aware, census numbers are used uh, to determine where the people live and how these maps are drawn. And we knew that there were substantial challenges uh, with the 2020 census. First and foremost, it was conducted during a global pandemic uh, that disproportionately affected black and brown people. Uh, because of our discrepancies our, um, in our socioeconomic factors, 70% uh, of COVID deaths in Louisiana uh, were from, from black communities, while black people are only one third of the state. Um, so we knew that was a substantial challenge. Uh, on top of that, 2020 was Louisiana's worst hurricane season since 2005 when Hurricanes Katrina and Rita struck. Um, so we knew that those were going to be two substantial challenges when it came to the census, and our figures were proven correctly. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, the Census Bureau uh, released numbers that, that about 19 million uh, minorities in this country were not counted um, dur during the census. The second thing uh, is that we knew that this was the first redistricting cycle since the passage of the Voting Rights Act that Louisiana did not have to go through preclearance. And in every previous redistricting cycle, uh, before the plans could be challenged in court, uh, they would have to go to the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Justice Department for, the, for approval. Unfortunately, that provision of the Voting Rights Act, Act was struck down in 2013. Uh, so right now, all of us are parties to a suit uh, in, in federal court, but, uh, but if we still had preclearance, uh, we would all be waiting on the, on the Justice Department to give us a decision. But still doing it with a, a smile on your face <laughs> and some camaraderie. Uh, Senator Hewitt, uh, the governor stated that HB1 did not meet the requirements and would inevitably be vetoed and come under litigation. So why pass this map if you know it's going to go to court? Well, I think the maps would have gone to court no matter what they look like. Um, so you can't stop people from filing a lawsuit. But, I, but we never would have passed a map that we didn't think would uh, withstand a court challenge because it was never my intent just to pass a map in the legislature. The end game has always been to pass a map that we thought could withstand any court challenges and we believe that we've done that. Senator Hewitt, let me ask you this. Uh, the governor has called for an independent commission to handle redistricting in our state. What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I think that, um, again, the people that are in the best position to, to draw the maps are those that were elected by the people to represent them, not an unelected commission. Uh, those, those do happen in some other states. They're very controversial. Those people are appointed by someone. You know, the idea behind them is you're taking the politics out of it, but there's politics in everything. There would be politics and who gets appointed to those. You're gonna get the same input. I think the process that we had this year is the most transparent process we have ever had in the state of Louisiana. Everything is posted online. Um, it, we, we took our time with all of the amendments. We considered the maps. It was a very public, transparent process. And I'm not convinced that an independent commission could do it any better. All right, well, so transparent. To Senator, Hewitt's, to, to Senator Hewitt's point about process, I think one thing that's got lost in this conversation and is very ironic is how substantially similar Senator Hewitt's map and Senator Field's maps are. If you look at SB2 that Senator Fields proposed and look at SB5, Senator Hewitt said that keeping Congressional District 1 as a coastal district where maritime was a major industry was a, a, a community of interest for her. Senator Fields' map keeps District 1 the, um, the same. Senator Hewitt said that District 3, a uh, priority for her was to ensure that Lake Charles and Lafayette were kept together and that District 3 was uh, kept as the heart of the Acadiana region. Uh, Senator Fields' map also keeps Lake Charles and most of Lafayette into District 3. Uh, Senator Hewitt's map keeps two districts in North Louisiana, Districts 4 and 5, uh, that are united by um, agriculture and logging industries. Um, Senator Fields' map does the exact same thing. The only substantial difference was that instead of packing black voters in New Orleans and Baton Rouge into just one, just one district, as Senator, Senator Hewitt's map does, Senator Fields' map kept the city of New Orleans as the anchor of District uh, 2 and took it west to include uh, areas of the Bayou region and the river parishes uh, where uh, other communities of, of black voters lived. So the only substantive major difference between those maps was that instead of having uh, one minority district, uh, there were two. But all of the other communities of interest that Senator Hewitt talked about uh, were kept together in Senator Fields' map as well. Is that correct? Yeah. I don't think that's 100% correct. I think there were municipalities that were split in some of the other maps or parishes that were split that we did not do in my map. And so I don't accept that that was the only substantial difference. Uh, but the details matter in redistricting, as you know. And, and Senator so Fields, I, I think that what about th that? There were some other differences, and it was my, my map, so I could speak to it a little bit more directly. Uh, it was, we had less parishes split than in Senate Bill 5, and we had a better deviation uh, in, in, in my map than, than we have in Senate Bill 5. But to answer your question about whether or not we should have a commission uh, versus the legislature creating maps, you know, what we really should do is pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. You know, it be, because that that's what's really needed uh, in this in this country. And let me tell you why. Because if we if we had the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, we probably wouldn't be sitting here, and we would not have had uh, a vote, uh, the kind of vote that we had in the legislature a few weeks ago. Uh, because the way we passed fair plans in the past is because we had an oversight of the federal government. The federal government has always been like the safeguard of the voting rights of people in Louisiana. And we just don't have that now. And until we get back to uh, having, you know, subsection five, you know, having the teeth in subsection five, uh, we are going to always have legislators in 10 states across the country to pass laws that will infringe upon the rights of African American. But, sen but Senator, if you if you believe that the federal government is in the best position to be able to draw our maps, then you should love my map because it looks virtually the same as the current congressional map that we have. But at the end of the day, there's just no reason not to pass this bill other than this bill creates two majority minority districts. Now, if Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was still enforced in Louisiana, there's just absolutely no way in the world the Louisiana legislature, both the House and the Senate, would not have passed that plan. So Senator Field point, thanks to Senator Fields and uh, Representative Duplessis, who you're gonna hear from in a second, and many other members of the Legislative Black Caucus, uh, we have a strong, robust, comprehensive record 
of racial discrimination in the passage of these maps. There was not a single point in the process, both in committee and on the floor, in the House and Senate, where the majority did not have a less discriminatory option that did not pack bl black voters in New Orleans and Baton Rouge into one district. Uh, so we are, we are very confident of the record that we built during the session and uh, it's in the hands of, of, of the courts right now. Senator Hewitt, final word. Well, again, I, th I think that the legislative process works. The judiciary will have an opportunity to weigh in. And I look forward to, you know, to that discussion. And it may be, you know, hopefully it's sooner rather than later so that we can resolve how to best run our congressional elections uh, this fall in 2022. All right. Thank you very much for being here, for your thoughtful input and your comments. And now for our final panel of the show, I'm going to be speaking with state representatives to hear their take on the redistricting process. But first, we'll take a look at the issue of redistricting, one that you may not have heard about. We sat down with Bruce Riley, the deputy director at Voice of the Experienced, to learn more about his work on what is known as prison gerrymandering. So I used to do a lot of like pencil portraits of people on the inside, but you know, sometimes I would do a big sports fan. That's actually black pen with colored pencil. It's pencil, that's pastel. That's actually a self-portrait, believe it or not, when I was in prison. My name is Bruce Riley. I'm the deputy director at Vote, Voice of the Experienced. We have chapters across the state in Baton Rouge and Lafayette, and we do a lot around structural reform, around mass incarceration and all the tie-ins with the criminal legal system. One of the things we've been trying to do for a few years now is raise the issue around felony disenfranchisement and around the prison-based gerrymandering. And the issue is that you have people who are put into a prison or a jail and, and literally are counted in a place where they're being detained, which on the one hand, someone would say, well, that's just like a factual thing. On the other hand, the reason why they're being counted is for political representation. And so it's really this perversion of saying like, you're gonna count me and give me more power based on these folks that I'm holding, but people who are counted inside of prisons as residents of that district, they're not given that opportunity to persuade or vote for what should be done. And even worse so, the person who is elected in that area has actually a pressure to maintain that industry which in this case is the industry of detaining people, but in the end, the product itself are people. And in this state, and in most states, uh, unfortunately, disproportionately, that product is black men. Prison gerrymandering happens in, I wanna say all but about 10 states. Some states have, have rectified it. Louisiana, as, as I think everyone understands, is the most incarcerated state, but on top of that, We've got over a hundred different places where people are incarcerated in our state. Our state is not that big you know, when it comes down to it from both population or, or geography. A lot of that came about because individual sheriffs over the years, back in the day, had their own chain gangs, their own jails. And so as those chain gangs became a force of revenue because they could rent out the workers, so we end up with all these different jails and prisons. And very interestingly, half of the people in Louisiana who are sentenced to state prison are sent into local jails with like a per diem fee. So it ends up becoming this like kind of subsidy. And the biggest issue sort of like mathematically in balance would be where you have uh, the biggest group of people and then the, the most like rural area. You know, taking Angola as an example, you know, there's over 5,000 people and anyone who's been up there knows that it's like super rural up that way. You know, like up in Allen Parish and Wind Parish and you know, there's, there's prisons that are, you know, 1,500 people, and there's not a lot of people around. And so a 1,000 folks can really kind of throw off the, uh, the, the math of coming up with a, a balanced district. So, you know, the bigger the prison, the more incarcerated people, and which we have, uh, the more the math becomes a challenge. But I think because of the sort of mosaic that Louisiana is, it creates this level of analysis paralysis and this confusion and then people just say like, nah, I'll just leave it alone. 
in, in prisons and correctional facilities in the state, affecting not just uh, the inmates, but wardens, uh, employees. So up in Baton Rouge at the state capitol, there's a lot of bills. I think there's about 900 different bills. And, you know, we've got an interest one way or another in somewhere around 100 of them. And we've brought this, this prison gerrymandering bill several years, and we've brought it to the House Government Affairs Committee. Um, we've explained the situation, tried to get change, and we've lost. And so we were just like, let's come up with a bill that will highlight this issue. We've you know, kind of given two options, and a lot of other states, uh, you know, advocates have gone the same type of route, and in some places have been successful. You know, option A is you count people at their so-called home address, or you can just not count them at all and make it like a, well, we're, we don't give these folks voting rights, therefore we're gonna divide it up amongst ourselves who do have voting rights to create these districts that are fair and so that places that have a prison in them don't have an outsized uh, level of voting power. Now granted, it's probably gonna be too little too late, but in the end, like, when is the wrong time to do the right thing? We're fortunate to be joined now by members of the Louisiana House who worked on redistricting from the other side of the Capitol. Representative John Stefanski represents District 42 in Acadia and Lafayette and is the chairman of the House and Governmental Affairs Committee, which oversaw redistricting. Representative Royce Duplessis represents District 93 in New Orleans and is the vice chair of the House and Governmental Affairs Committee. And Bruce Riley, who we just heard from, is the Deputy Director at Voice of the Experience. Mr. Riley, let me start with you first and get a little more information about your work on what you call prison gerrymandering. So prisoners are being counted for how much representation an area gets, but they're left out of the voting process. So why is this a problem? Yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, obviously the point of counting people is not just to tabulate the amount of people that we have, it's for representation for our democracy, because we have a representative democracy. And we've often heard the principle, one person, one vote. Uh, I think it was just said in the last segment. And the reality is, if you have people who are being counted one person, one vote concept for redistricting, how are you going to count people who don't have the right to vote? Right. And so it's a total perversion right there. And then when you start thinking about uh, other problems, which is about representing the interests of your area, representatives of DePlessis and Stefanski, they have, they both have people they need to represent, they have industries, they have jobs, and different things that they need to represent, but are they really representing all of their residents if some of them are incarcerated? So that's what you're trying to fix with your bill. Tell us about that. Uh, one of the things you pro propose to remedy what would be considered prison gerrymandering, what are some of the things your bill would say? Yeah, so Representative Denise Marcel from Baton Rouge, she put a bill in, uh, HB 846. Basically what it does, it says, if you want to count somebody as a resident for redistricting purposes, you have to give them the right to vote. All right. You don't have to count them, but you also don't have to give them the right to vote, but those things have to be linked together. Okay. Um, Representative Stefanski, what do you think of changing where prisoners are counted? Yeah, you know, I, th I think it's an interesting conversation. Um, there's a few other states that, that have done that, but it's, it's important to take a step back and, and understand what the census is and how people get counted. You know, it's a it's a federal thing. You know, the, the federal government sends people and counts everyone. And the federal government counts you where you are. You know, so if you're currently incarcerated, they're going to count you there. It's not very dissimilar to kids living in dorms and on college campuses because even though those students may have a different residence, at, they're counted while they're, you know, let's say LSU, while they're located on LSU's campus. And so it, it, there really are some similarities to both of those. Uh, but look, I, I think it's something that we, we do need to look at and, and explore. Um, I'm certainly open to the, the prospect of possibly saying, hey, you know, if, if these individuals don't have the right to vote, which they don't under Louisiana's law, if, if you're currently incarcerated, you can't vote. And actually, if you've been incarcerated in the past five years, you can't vote in Louisiana. And so um, I, I, I'm certainly open to that conversation. I think it's an evolving conversation, but not necessarily as black and white as just we either count them or, or, or we don't. Well, if I could add just one thing to mm -hmm. that is, um, although the federal government does count you where you are, actually for this census, they created a tool where yeah. you can tag and, and flag people who are incarcerated for the very reason of being able to allocate them 
either cut them out of the map or to allocate them back to other home addresses. Representative yeah. Duplessis, let me ask you this. What are you thinking about the idea of counting prisoners at their home address or not counting them at all? Well, I think the concept is something that requires a lot more education, educating the public, educating legislators, policy makers, but it is one that I think we have to address just from a pure standpoint of fundamental fairness. It's really hard to reconcile the principle of one person, one vote, if there is representation being allocated based upon populations in certain areas, but those people in that area, mm -hmm. whether with their will or against their will, are being counted in that particular area, but their interests are somewhere else. And so that, that's the first issue. The second issue is, and uh, both, of, both uh, Chairman Stefanski and Bruce have pointed this out, that you have this quote unquote representation for people who in many cases aren't even allowed to vote. So that is, a, that is a, the second piece of this that I think definitely needs to be addressed. And I'm hoping as a nation, we can uh, work on this prior to the next census in 10 years. Representative Stefanski, as the chairman of the House and Governmental Affairs Committee, many bills like this one are brought to the committee's desk. What is the process for hearing from different interests, such as Mr. Riley's organization, and also applying it to the redistricting process? Look, as chairman, my, my job really is to steer the committee. It's to set the agenda. Um, it, it's to make sure there is, uh, you know, there's not too much infighting, maintain, maintain kind of the... Uh, the, the quorum and, the, and, and everything that goes along with that. And when you have um, bills that can sometimes, and not that this is necessarily one of those, but as chairman, when you have bills that can be controversial, when, would that bring a lot of emotion? Um, really, my job is to kind of keep everyone in line and he let all of the views be heard, not only from the committee, because my committee is made up of very uh, diverse individuals from very different areas of our state, but also from uh, those who are coming to testify, uh, like from his organization. And everyone should have an opportunity to have their voice heard, and everyone should have an opportunity to um, to let the committee understand why this is important, because that's the that's what this is all about. You know, we take all of these different views, we hear them, we vet those views, and then ultimately we make a decision that we feel is best for our district and for the state of Louisiana, and we do that by voting. Representative Duplessis, the Black Caucus never veered from their request for a second Black majority congressional district. Is it possible to have an equitable map with just one Black majority? I think it is possible because, again, the outcome is not what we were advocating for. It was the opportunity, and it was about the process, and it was about ensuring that there be a second opportunity or a district for African American voters to feel like they had the chance to send someone to Congress. Whether or not they chose to do that in terms of an outcome, that, that's not what we were fighting for. Uh, so I think it's definitely possible. And if you look at statistics from across the country, uh, there are districts that may be, quote unquote, majority minority, but they may not necessarily be represented by uh, a person of color. So we see examples like that. But I think the whole goal and the, the fight that the Black Caucus put forward during the redistricting process and that we're still putting forward was really just to create a second district where voters had an opportunity to select a candidate of choice. Well, creating a second black majority district would dilute the black population in District 2 from around 60 percent to about 52 percent. So could the addition of a second district cause the opposite result and actually decrease minority representation? Well, we heard that argument being put forward. Uh, I don't accept that argument, quite frankly. Uh, there was no data or any, um, any real examples to show why Congressional District 2 would still not be competitive or why Congressional District 2 would in some way lose minority representation. So uh, when you look at what we are losing as a state by not having a second Congressional District, the concept or the idea that if we reduced one district uh, from 60 or 52, the numbers that you that you gave, that we would in some way lose both. I, I don't I don't uh, accept that argument simply because there were no examples to or, or, or studies or data to support that in any in any way. We we feel confident that with the maps that Senator Fields proposed, with the amendments that I proposed, and many of my colleagues proposed, both districts would perform well to produce in in, in all likelihood uh, minority representation. Mr. Riley. Yeah, I think if. 
you know, if someone were to check about, I think it's maybe 22 congressional districts around the country that are minority majority. And I want to say 20 of them have uh, a person of color representing them. Most of them are black majority, but some have some uh, Latino or Asian majority. So the idea that people in New Orleans, for example, uh, white people like myself who lives in New Orleans would not vote for black uh, politics this is this is my representative right here <laughs> <laughs> I voted for the guy um, and you know that we're we're very familiar with voting for for black politicians and one would say the same about Baton Rouge and the, the thing that, that sort of kills me about the whole you know one district I don't can't think of a single state where you can take your two largest cities and turn them into one district like name another state where you've done that this is our two biggest cities mm -hmm. and they have one district but somehow, you know, and you want to combine La also uh, Lake Charles and, La and Lafayette. So I just feel like that alone should be something that the court is going to look at and say there's no reason why Baton Rouge and, and New Orleans should be one district. And, and, and I just want to follow up from this, this point. You know, we get oftentimes lost by in, in the numbers. And this was a numbers-driven process because we used the data that we got from the federal census. And I think there's a good argument to be made that there was significant undercount. But separate and apart from any undercounts that may have taken place and the numerical argument, there was a, a, an argument of fairness. Even if it doesn't result in that outcome, we had an obligation to try. We had an obligation to put the effort forward. So uh, whatever the outcomes may have been, I think as a legislative body, we could live with that. But I think our obligation was to put forth the effort. Representative Stefanski, then hearing all of this, is it time for an independent committee to handle this process or jump in? Well, so let's, let's go to why the legislature does this. It does it because the Louisiana Constitution vests this authority with us. And so ultimately, the only way to change the Constitution is to pass not only pass a bill, but to go back to the voters and let them decide. And what I would ask is that, what's the motivation? Is, is the motivation to take the politics out of this? If it is, I don't think you're ever going to do that because someone is going to have to appoint this commission. Those members of that commission are going to have political leanings and, and different diverse backgrounds. I mean, it's, I, I would have to hear and, and it would have to be articulated to me what the purpose is. Um, I, I personally feel like, you know, we're the representatives. We, we've been elected. Uh, you know, my constituents sent me here and, and they expect me and, and they expect me to make the right decisions for them. And, and so I believe the system works. Um, if, if someone t gave me a different reason other than taking the politics out of it, I, I'm certainly willing to listen. But it seems to me every time an independ independent commission gets mentioned, it's, well, we need to get the politics out of this. And, and I frankly just think that's impossible. Mr. Duplessis, what would you say about that? Well, when you're in the majority and you have the numbers to, uh, to, to get the outcomes that you're generally pushing for, I can see why my chairman would have that response. Look, let me, let me say this. I, I, don't, I don't totally disagree with the idea that simply having an independent commission removes the politics out of anything. I don't disagree with that. However, as it relates to the state House maps, the state Senate maps, I think there's a, a different argument to be made there because in, in, in that instance, we are literally drawing the seats where in most cases we, we're looking to possibly be, probably be running for re-election in those particular districts. So I think in those instances, the, the politics are even more fierce and, 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 and there's more protectionism at play and more self-interest at play as opposed to if we're drawing district maps for Congress, which we don't serve in, or if we're drawing district maps for the Supreme Court, which we don't serve in. But when we're, when we're drawing maps for districts and seats that we actually currently hold, I think there's a legitimate case to be made uh, just to remove some of the toxicity out of the process. And we as colleagues still have to work with one another. So, so that's why I'm in favor of the idea, although I do agree it will not remove all of the politics from it. And Royce, Royce brings up an interesting point. It is, it is you know, <laughs> with the House districts, you yeah. know, it is, it's a balance. And, yeah. and he's right, it, it's, it's very personal to the very members. Personal. But on the other side, who knows these districts better than yeah. the member who represents them? That's I right. mean, and Royce and I will have conversations. We know where every, right. every landmark is, every That's street right. corner. And so it's kind of, you know, it, it's a give and take. Uh, and it's, 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 it's good conversation, though, it is. And, and I think Louisiana, as we evolve, we need to continue to have those conversations about, does this system work for us? So, yeah. Mr. Riley, let me just ask you your input on that. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, one of our models is, like, we're not term limited. So <laughs> we have a, a different approach. And the work that we do is very much statewide. Um, and so, you know, we've gone into the, our work whether in our minds, you know, Republican, Democrat, black, white, urban, rural, doesn't matter. 
you know, for us, it's a human issue. And I think for us, the success that we've had in, in advancing policy has been by, you know, educating and encouraging people from all across the state about the changes that we think need to happen. But from our perspective, it's really about hearts and minds, and it's really about having a, a more educated population that can then do right by the rest of us. You know, I, and one other point I would like to touch on is I, I really do believe this was democracy, you know, really at its finest. It really was a civics lesson. You had the legislative branch that passed maps. You had the executive branch that vetoed that one of the maps. You know, then you had the legislative branch has the ability to override, which was done. Now we have the judicial branch, which ultimately is going to make a decision as well. I mean, it, it really... It really is a case study for, for, for democracy. And I do feel like we've been in a bit of a civics class, too. <laughs> oh, it, it certainly has been. You know, every day that I go into the Capitol, it's my job as his representative and, and, and 44,000 others in my district to go in there with a sense, of, a sense of optimism. Unfortunately, when we went into the redistricting process, I think there was already a sense of the fact that we were not going to come to an agreement. And uh, on all sides, uh, I would say that there was a there was a, a the, the belief that we would end up in court. Mm -hmm. Certainly, given the fact that we are no longer under uh, voting the preclearance requirement of the Voting Rights Act, I think that was even more so of a reason why there was an anticipation for litigation. Given what we're about to spend now in terms of uh, costs as a state, it, it is unfortunate. I, I don't know that it would have been avoidable. Uh, I, I wish we could have avoided it. Yes, we get sued on a lot of other bills, but there's no question that on uh, both sides that much m more resources were put in in preparation and anticipation for litigation. All right, so that's where we are, yeah. and we'll see what happens. Yep. Thank you so much that's for right. being here and sharing your thoughts. Uh, we appreciate it. For our final segment of the show, I'm going to be speaking with the producer of Louisiana Spotlight, Ben Johnson. We'll find out what he experienced making this month's episode. Ben, thanks so much for sitting down to talk about this topic. And, and what is it about this topic of redistricting that made you want to focus a show like this on it? Uh, well, we've been trying to, you know, cater our shows on Louisiana Spotlight to something that affects all citizens in Louisiana and, you know, is current, number one, and also that might a lot of people might not know about. So um, I felt this show, I didn't know much about redistricting before this. And I've learned a lot. And but there's I've, a lot to know. There is a about lot. It, and, it, and, and, it and affects, it's complex. Yeah, and it affects all of us in, in every way. What did you learn that surprised you? Well, the prison gerrymandering piece that I did, that really surprised me. I, I had no idea that, you know, prisoners getting counted for a district that they can't vote in had such a, an effect on the maps and, and what actually comes out. What about the future? What's coming up next uh, in your thoughts as you look at different topics uh, and topics that are happening right now for Louisiana Spotlight? We're, we're currently looking for the next topic of our, our next show, um, and that'll be out around August. And also in August, uh, we're going to be releasing the documentary on our last Spotlight that we did. So there's a lot of uh, exciting things coming out. Ben, thanks so much. All right. Thank you. And we've run out of time for our discussion tonight. We want to thank Dr. Procopio, Senator Hewitt, Senator Fields, Representative Duplessis, Representative Stefanski, Mr. Evans and Mr. Riley for sharing their thoughts on redistricting. And we encourage you to comment on tonight's show by visiting lpb.org slash Louisiana Spotlight and clicking on the Join the Conversation link. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks everyone for watching and have a good night. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.